Marketing Today is sponsored by Light Matter. Have you ever wondered how fast growth companies seem to build top notch software applications so quickly? Or have you ever struggled to get your own company's UX and app to deliver the awesome customer experience you were going for? Yeah, I've been there. That's where Light Matter comes in. Light Matter acts as a direct extension of design and development teams at some of the world's top companies. Whether your company needs a website or an app, they can help. The New York Times, Bloomberg, Code Academy, McCann, and dozens of others already trust them. Check them out at lightmatter.com. That's L-I-G-H-T-M-A-T-T-E-R.com. Tell them Alan sent you. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, we're going to cover some adult topics. So for those people that may have kids in earshot, you may want to listen to this somewhere else today. I'm excited today because we're going to have a special guest, Phil Harvey. He's the chairman of DKT International a nonprofit family planning and AIDS prevention organization. And he's also chairman, major shareholder of PHE Incorporated, which is the holding company of Adam and Eve, a mail order business that sells products for a better sex life. And he's also the founder of the DKT Liberty Project. Invited Phil on today primarily because in my mind, we've been talking on a number of episodes about purpose, um, about social responsibility, about doing good through the use of business and business techniques. And I believe Phil's done that. He may disagree with me and the mechanisms in which he deploys business to, to do good in the world. He has a very unique take on that. And we'll get into also his libertarian views and the pure focus of what business should be about, which may be counter to doing good with business in some respects. He's a Milton Friedman acolyte and believes that businesses are really all about returning shareholder money um, and retur- shareholding re- shareholder returns, I should say. That being said, he's done quite a b- bit of good in the world um, through both nonprofit arms as well as uh, his business aspirations to drive outcomes uh, in family planning and, and health outcomes all around the world. So I hope you enjoy this long conversation with Phil Harvey and learn from his years of business experience. Well, Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to have you here, somebody I've been following for a number of years, but we'll get into that in a minute. I want to start with more of a personal question. You're 81, I believe. That's right. And I just want to go back to 1961 when you're going to Harvard or about to go to Harvard. Um, And how would you describe the difference between the man sitting here in front of me now, and that young man from 1961. Well, age does make a difference. Going back a a couple of years earlier, in 1959-60, for example, I simply had no idea what I wanted to do, no idea of where I was going. I was sort of experimenting with various courses and various majors or anticipating various majors in college. And... For the next few years of my life, I would say I kind of let things happen rather than taking initiative on my own own life. But eventually, uh, I began to focus. Now, the difference today is I've done most of what I'm going to (laughs) do, and uh, uh, there's no uncertainty about what has taken place, and certainly less uncertainty about what I hope to do in the next few years in addition, although that's, I expect, relatively minor compared to uh, uh, 50 or 60 years worth of, of, uh, of getting things done in various, in, in various uh, spheres. Mm-hmm. So the big difference is uncertainty, hopes, dreams set to save the world, on the one hand, and uh, looking back as much as forward now, I don't think we've quite saved the world. There still seem to be a few things that need to be done. Uh, But 
I don't have those uncertainties that I did in the early part of my life. Mm. Got it. Well, like I said before, I, I have been fascinated by you since I, since I met you the first time. If I go back and I recount why for listeners, uh, about 15 years ago, I was at business school studying sustainable business models, meaning business models where we were trying to use business to do good in the world in some form or fashion. Um, and sometimes that was a funding scheme. Sometimes that was models. Sometimes that's models that just were oriented towards making money and doing good at the same time. Now, flash forward five years from that time when I was in business school 15 years ago, so 10 years ago. And this was at UNC? Or? Yeah, 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 UNC, which is all, we, we share that, I guess, in common. Yes, you went, you went to your master's there, too. You know, fast forward five years from that point, um, and I'm working in reproductive health care and across the globe, uh, and I come across DKT. And, and then the CEO of that organization and I meet with you. And lo and behold, did I realize that you've had a sustainable business model of some form or fashion since 1970. And here I was studying it as if it was something new and novel. Um, and from that moment, I kind of said, started scratching my head saying, wow, I didn't, I, I don't think many people in the business community knew that business could be doing good at the same time that long ago. Um, and so my question, I guess, is I would love for you to describe the combination of what you've been doing over since 1970, what's now PHE and DKT. And I know there's other organizations in there that we'll probably hit on as well over the years about using commerce in a way to help provide sustainable funding for international health needs. Well, I may surprise you a bit in this respect because I don't think that a commercial enterprise uh, should be very much concerned with itself doing good and accomplishing great things in the world other than making a profit for its shareholders and employees. Uh, that said, I think that, that uh, PHE, which is the commercial uh, company that uh, sells sexually oriented products of various kinds and has been doing so, as you say, since around 1970, should uh, maintain a, a design and an atmosphere that is very supportive of its employees, that makes it a good citizen of the community where it works. But I am generally opposed to trying to turn a commercial a corporation into some kind of brand for saving the world. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate. It's a distraction, and often, uh, often it just doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are partnerships when AT and T or other very well-known companies want to associate, let us say, with with desirable coffee makers in Central America, and they take a pride in making sure that the coffee mm. that, that they're providing or recommending has been raised under humane and decent circumstances. I have no, no problem with that. But their, their main business should remain their main business, and I've always felt that way uh, about PHE. PHE is profitable, but the charities that the company supports are mostly local charities to make us part of a, being a, a good citizen of, of uh, Hillsboro. It's, it's engaging and I think worthwhile for our own employees uh, to be involved with those local uh, charities and activities. But the company does not make any contributions to international family planning. Hmm. That's done through me. Gotcha. Uh, once a shareholder uh, has earned a, a dividend or a distribution, then he or she is perfectly free to give it to whomever they wish. Right. And in my case, and that's what makes the 20% uh, figure that, uh, that you cite, that 20% mm -hmm. of our profits are, are put to work on charitable activities, that comes from the fact that several of us, although I don't know the 
the charitable activities very much of other employees <laughs> here, but twenty uh, percent of of those profits ending up via the shareholders is is a perfectly accurate and probably even a modest um, uh, estimate. But I think commercial companies should remain. Uh, focused on their commercial activities. Uh, I agree more with Milton Friedman, who has stated or did state quite emphatically some years ago that the primary obligation of a commercial corporation is to its shareholders. Mm -hmm. And I am somewhat suspect of the current tendency among commercial companies to try to look good and buff up their image, mm -hmm. buff up their brand by uh, doing conspicuous good things. In, some, in many cases, because I don't think they do it very well. <laughs> and secondly, because it's a distraction from what they ought to be doing, which is operating right. profitably, ethically, honestly, mm -hmm. and with well-treated employees, all of that, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see no great virtue, for example, in the Whole Foods approach mm -hmm. that uh, John Mackey is justifiably credited with. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful businessman, and he built a, a wonderful company around Whole Foods. But the movement for growing and consuming foods, uh, according to to the, um, what's the term for um, their uh, specialty approach to farming and... Uh, uh, local, and local sourcing? Or well, lo local sourcing. And organic, yeah. And organic. Uh, I see no particular virtue to organic growing because it uses just as much pesticides, uh, different pesticides, mm -hmm takes more acreage to grow the same amount of food and I think is something of a, uh, a fad for well-to-do people rather than uh, something that's going to actually improve the world. So th those kinds of side trips, uh, I think, are not only distractions, but s to some extent, I think the organic movement is doing the world a disservice. Hmm. Now, there are not very many people who agree with me about that. <laughs> But but there are some, and um, uh, it, it to me it represents a misplacement right. of eliminary uh, charitable uh, efforts on on behalf of of uh, commercial corporations or uh, private companies uh, in a way that distracts them from what what they. Uh, uh, really ought to be focused right. on. Well, as I was doing my, my research for today, I, um, I fully expected you to disagree with me on a number of fronts. And I'm glad that we're... I don't know if we're having a disagreement, but it's definitely maybe surprising to listeners to hear your point of view around business and its pure focus and what it should be focused on. Because you as an individual, as you mentioned have done a lot of great things with the profits from that business and, you know, in terms of helping people all around the world. And so if we, for a moment, if we can go back to 1970, I believe it was you and Tim Black, your partner, co-conspirator, if you will, on these two efforts that you went on. Why did you guys create a commercial business and a non-profit? I, I don't know if it was a non-profit at the time, but I think it was a non-profit. Why did you create both of those at the same time? Well, uh, it's a fair, the, the answer to that is fairly simple and uh, no, no great credit to either one of us that things turned out that way. Our focus when we met uh, here in Chapel Hill in 1969 uh, was definitely nonprofit. Tim was a physician who had spent many years in the bush in Africa saving lives as a, as a medical man. I had spent just spent five years in India with care, feeding children. We had both developed uh, a deep conviction that what the world needed was family planning and that 
the health service delivery networks that existed at the time and indeed today uh, were insufficient for bringing uh, contraceptives and birth control to very large numbers of people which we were convinced we had the answer to, that is through social marketing, which we'll get to yeah. um, uh, uh, briefly. But the reason for the split was that we began uh, by selling condoms by mail in the United States, which was illegal at the time, believe it or not. Uh, there was an old law dating from the 1870s that said any form of contraception or any information about contraception or abortion is obscene and unmailable, and therefore nobody was selling condoms by mail in the United States, and uh, we decided that's what we were going to do despite warnings from lawyers that we could go to jail for it, I think indicative of Tim's uh, personality especially, but also my own. Uh, we thought that the publicity we would get from behind bars <laughs> in a jail somewhere for having sold an FDA-approved product to people who really badly <laughs> need it uh, would, be, would be adequate recompense for any time we had to do. The upshot of that was that the original PSI, and here we do have to get ourselves back into some acronyms, <laughs> was b buying and selling condoms as mm -hmm. part of its activity, which is a perfectly legitimate part of act activity to provide particularly uh, condoms to students. Uh, in, a, in a period when uh, teenage pregnancy was even more serious, considerably more serious than it is now. Mm. And that was certainly, as far as the IRS was concerned, is a, a legitimate nonprofit activity. But I got a call from an IRS agent who was processing our application for a charitable status under the usual 501c3 designation. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, you don't look like a charity. He said, you're buying uh, condoms, and that's fine, and selling them, uh, and that's fine, but buying and selling things is what private businesses do, uh, not what charities do. And I should have probably consulted a lawyer because that right. was wrong. I mean, uh, 501c3 rules certainly uh, allow you to buy and sell products mm -hmm. at a markup. But I uh, was new to the game, and this was the IRS, and I figured, well, and he said, why don't you just create another corporation? So we did. Hmm. Uh, we had PSI, the nonprofit, <clears throat> and we created what was then called PPA, the precursor organization to PHE, the, the original Adam and Eve, in order to get nonprofit charitable tax status for the other organization, which set about uh, promoting uh, contraception first off in, in Kenya, which, of course, the IRS thought was just dandy. So the, my, my feelings subsequently, some of which I've already expressed, right. uh, were a result of the experimenting with the for-profit PHE uh, and the nonprofit PSI, and I began to realize as as we worked with both organizations that it was actually better to have them separated hmm. uh, because the focus on the for-profit company began w was profit. Right. We, we wanted. Adam and Eve, the, the young PHE, to be profitable and and profitable enough so that we could use some of the proceeds of that enterprise to support uh, developing country activities and family planning. Hmm. And it turned out that that was quite possible. So it's something of an accident that the <laughs> split occurred that way, not a result of great wisdom on my part or anyone else's. But it turned out very well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, and I mean, I, I think that's what sparked my interest originally to have this conversation. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about Tim Black? Because 
I never got a chance. I, I did go to the UK and I, I learned about uh, his later organization he created after you guys started these other two that we just talked about, PHE, or the precursor to PHE and PSI. And went and visited with uh, Marie Stopes International um, and learned about the good work that they were doing. But tell us a little bit about Tim because he was, uh, I think, uh, passed away before I could get a chance to, to interview him as well. Yes, Tim died about three, three and a half years ago now. Well, Tim was an extraordinary guy. He, he was impatient, iconoclastic, <laughs> Very much what uh, the, the consultants in the business world were calling a bias for action. I mean, Tim was bias for action personified. <laughs> uh, he, he was <clears throat> very impatient with impediments, with committees that got in the way of making decisions and taking action. He wrote a good deal about uh, family planning organizations which in those days were heavily focused on health and health service delivery networks. He said they're all constipated. They can't make a decision. <laughs> they have too many committees. They have too many meetings. Uh, they spend a lot of time at conferences and fancy hotels in Bangladesh congratulating each other on what wonderful things they're doing, and they get practically nothing done. And Tim's uh, uh, disdain for meetings as opposed to decision-making by executives, was expressed in, in his view that the ideal meeting consisted of two people, one of whom was homesick. <laughs> um, he, he, and that, that, I think, represents reasonably well his, his uh, view of, of um, the go-slow tendency of... The United Nations and uh, uh, other family planning organizations that were working around the world, they tended to be dominated uh, by that interesting example. At one point, the United Nations uh, had a condom promotion group, and uh, they drew up a plan for a a uh, condom promoting plan in typical developing countries. This is meant to be used almost anywhere in the developing world. Uh, they wanted uh, a committee that had uh, several health representatives on it, uh, tourist uh, representatives, uh, import export representatives, gender equality representatives. You couldn't, you could hardly think of a of a committee in a developing country that they didn't want represented on the condom uh, board. Right. And Tim took one look at this and said, they'll never get a goddamn thing done, and they didn't. <laughs> and you, know, you could tell that right. they wouldn't. Right. Um, and uh, he, well, we founded uh, both PSI and later MSI, his British uh, charity that mm -hmm. is uh, engaged in very similar work, although uh, they stress clinic-based family planning yeah. services, including abortion, uh, whereas in my career I have mostly supervised organizations specializing in the family, in the uh, social marketing of, mm -hmm. of contraceptives, right. which is a, a somewhat different game, but mm -hmm. it aims to do the same thing. Right, right. Well, I realize we, we've been talking about PHE and we might – be as well to describe it a little bit, um, and then we can go into some other topics. But for listeners, PHE or Phil Harvey Enterprises was the, I guess, the nomenclature. Yeah, we haven't we for. haven't used that ever, but that is where it did. did that's where from. it did come from. Yeah, you guys operate um, Adam and Eve, which is one of, if not the largest, adult product sellers in the U.S. and Canada, I believe. But you also just purchased the Excite Group. Um, in Australia, and I think I've got that correct. But I'm Yes, gonna, you do. We've got a growing listener base, actually, in Australia. So. Uh -huh. Well, no, we're delighted to, to be associated with Excite, which is a, a mail-order company that sells sexually-oriented products, uh, including a lot of lingerie, which is sort of semi-sexually oriented, I guess. <laughs> A very well-run company. The owner wanted to sell out a year or so ago. Uh, we are very interested in international markets. Mm -hmm. 
we had been selling a fair amount, a fair number of vibrators, particularly to Australia, directly from here, which is awkward. Yeah, logistically challenged. <laughs> And uh, we, we heard about the, the possible acquisition of the Excite Group. And uh, after the usual long negotiations and discussions, uh, we bought it just a few months ago. And it seems to be going well. And we hope that by combining the expertise and experience of the two organizations, it's, it's not the same size. PHE is about $150 million uh, gross uh, mm -hmm. or a company now, and I believe Excite is about 12, 14 million, but we hope it will pull us more into the international market. Yeah. We see considerable potential in, uh, in China and definitely some in India, though we have not gone very far with India yet. We've gotten some more, uh, we, we've gotten a little bit farther with the Chinese market. But we're very happy to have it. So far, it's working fine. I felt from the beginning uh, that acquiring something that was about as far away from North Carolina <laughs> as you could possibly imagine uh, might present uh, some difficulties. <laughs> but we have two or three people who insist that jet lag doesn't bother them all that much. <laughs> uh, I'm not and sure I believe that. But, and but, that's, uh, a, that, that's a over a 20-hour combined flight to get there probably yes from here. just about yeah, yeah. just about so we're happy to have it so far so good that's great that's great well um I, it's good to see you expanding and we talked about before and i and thank you for clarifying i didn't realize that most of the charitable contributions that come out of phe are actually individual based yes um with the exception of some local stuff for the local community support. that's correct so Thank you for doing the work that you're doing and giving back so much on a personal level. Um, one of the things I thought we could move into is just talking about DKT and social marketing. Right. I guess before we launch into social marketing, can you describe what DKT is and, and, and what the type of work that you're doing all around the world today? Well, uh, DKT, in fact, is social marketing. It, it relies almost entirely on the the rules and the principles of social marketing. Uh, f first, we've got to clear up that social marketing in this context has nothing to do with social media or mm -hmm. marketing on social media in the United States <laughs> or elsewhere. Uh, social marketing in, uh, in this context uh, means the use of commercial marketing techniques to achieve social ends. Mm -hmm. And DKT, which, which was founded in 1989, uh, has stressed that uh, approach to the provision of contraceptives and information about contraceptives uh, from the get-go and, and still does today. The magic of social marketing is its simplicity and scalability. Hmm. Uh, uh, this was Tim's, <coughs> uh, Tim's thought from the beginning. Uh, if if we could get contraceptives into every little tea stall and shop and sore store and sorry sorry shop and uh, th th that Brook Bond Tea is available in in India, for example, mm. where there are more than a hundred thousand retail outlets, and there are tens of thousands and often more than a hundred thousand retail outlets in every major country. Mm -hmm. And our, our hypothesis, which we were very lucky to have uh, defined and clarified um, by a paper and some work that was done in the Indian Institute of Calcutta in the 1960s uh, by a Ford Foundation consultant named Peter King. They put this idea together and proposed it to the government of India that, that uh, if they hired... Um, the tea companies and the battery companies and the kerosene companies uh, to distribute condoms, um, uh, they, they would be reaching far more people than they were able to reach right. uh, through any other mechanism. We took that idea, made a variation on it, 
rather than hiring the companies themselves, uh, we began by creating our own companies, mm. some of them for profit, most of them non-profit, in the countries where uh, we wanted to make a difference. It's then at least theoretically fairly simple mm. to buy uh, a, a good quality contraceptive, and we were lucky also in that the Asian, the Asian manufacturers uh, were coming along big time in those mm -hmm. days, and we could get condoms and pills, which are the two uh, products we started with, uh, pretty cheaply, package them attractively, mm -hmm. contract with a distributor who routinely uh, distributed uh, similar products, anything that goes to a drugstore, for example, analgesics or a variety of other products, mm. uh, allow them an appropriate markup, uh, allow the storekeeper an appropriate markup, and then get on television and radio and wall paintings and sailboats and everything <laughs> else you can think of to promote the brand. Right. Uh, and it is possible through, through that approach to have your contraceptives in tens of thousands of stores very quickly while other uh, organizations are building more clinics and training people to run the clinics. And mass media, of course, goes out immediately once you have a campaign designed. Right. Uh, shopkeepers uh, are like to, to deal with products that are heavily advertised. They know they will move. Mm -hmm. And distributors, with distributors, it's the same way. Uh, to cut a, a long story short, because this is scalable, because it can it can reach so many people uh, through mechanisms that are already established right. and networks that already exist, uh, DKT last year uh, was supply, uh, supplying contraceptive products for 44 million couples in the developing world. Uh, that is scale. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the definition of scale. <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, that took 20 years, probably a little more than 1990, 28 years 28. to reach that level, but uh, it, it was growing steadily all, all the time, and, and uh, we were fairly confident that this kind of scale uh, was was possible. Now, I should interject that contraceptives, and here again we got lucky, seem to be particular, particularly amenable to this approach. Right. Uh, social marketing through this same model, mm. distribution, retailers, and so on, has been tried with oral rehydration salts, for example, which is a very valuable a product mm -hmm. for treating diarrhea uh, among infants especially. And while there's been some interest in that, it's nothing like the extent to which a social marketing uh, has been able to move contraceptives through, and through the developing world to very, very large numbers of people and a number of other uh, uh, categories of product, clean water tablets, for right. example, yeah. uh, have been tried. Uh, and for some reason, contraceptives just seem to work this way, <laughs> seem to be amenable to this approach, and DKT's 44 million is less than half of the total uh, services and uh, uh, products being supplied by uh, through the social marketing mechanism uh, now. So it isn't just DKT by any manner of means. Right. That is essentially uh, how it works. Mm. There's one other advantage to this approach that to me personally is, is very important. The people who benefit from these activities don't know who the hell we are. <laughs> they have no reason to be grateful to us. And I'll quickly tell you a story that, that, that reveals the, the, my, my feelings about this. When I was working with CARE, we were supplying very large quantities of, of milk powder and cornmeal to 
some flood areas in uh, north, uh, northwestern uh, India. And those people were really hurting, and I was sent up to supervise the uh, inventory of milk powder and, and, and cornmeal. And when I arrived at this area, there was cooking going on, there was feeding going on, there was a long, long line of people waiting for some food. I mean, they were hungry. And I went about some routine work. And a woman with a baby handed her baby to somebody behind her and came running over to me and knelt down on the ground and touched her forehead to my shoes. I, I didn't, I was stunned. I, I didn't know what to think or say or do. But at that moment, I, I said, if we're going to help people, we're going to help them in a way that they can maintain their dignity. We're not going to ask them to be grateful. They shouldn't need to be grateful. Uh, and social marketing is is very good in that respect. People are simply buying at what is a subsidized but still very significant price. Mm. They're buying something with their own money. They are customers. They're not beneficiaries. Mm. Uh, they have every reason to hold their heads up. And the the fact that they we don't meet them and they don't meet us, as far as I'm concerned, is a big plus. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that story. That's an important story. It, it sounds like it has uh, that type of experience has shaped shaped you? Yes, it's, it's certainly one of the experiences that shaped my my feelings and my views of uh, right. that aspect of trying to do good in the world. <laughs> gotcha. Well, um, I want to ask a question because you know DKT, like you said, is scalable. It's also measurable, right? Because you can calculate sales, um, and you can you understand how many products are moving through the system. Yes, this is very important, and I'm glad you mentioned it because I should have. But when uh, you are delivering a product that the end user must pay for, then every transaction is backed by a movement of cash. Mm. The cash goes from the customer to the to the retailer, it goes from the retailer to the wholesaler, and there are sometimes other steps in between, but then it ends up back mm -hmm. at the DKT office in whatever country it may it right. may be. So you have quite sound discipline right. over uh, the the uh, distribution. They're easily auditable and verifiable. This is not to say that things don't go wrong sometimes. They right. do. There are cheats and yeah. thefts and other things in this process as they are in, in all others. But it is rigorous in terms of measurability. And when you convert the number of, of contraceptives that are delivered to what we call a couple years of protection, which is basically a, a unit that describes sufficient uh, contraceptive coverage to uh, prevent pregnancy for one couple for one year. Mm -hmm. 100 condoms, for example, is normally thought to be about enough to prevent pregnancy. 13 or 14 cycles of, of uh, pills uh, and so on. And when you have that figure mm -hmm. in your basket, uh, and then the cost that it has taken to subsidize, usually the subsidies uh, go into the marketing mm -hmm. uh, because there's usually enough uh, margin in the, in the product itself to cover the, the shopkeeper and the wholesaler. Mm. But you, you have a cost per CYP, and this allows you, that is a cost per unit, of uh, impact, mm -hmm. and this allows you to compare one kind of family planning program with another right. uh, and work toward maximum efficiency uh, on that basis. It also puts a lot of trust in that system if, you're, if you, your system is designed in such a way that people have to pay, 
right? It's not you're not donating the product. You because you could roll up a truck and dump a million condoms off somewhere and no one ever see them. Yeah, uh, we've and and we've seen this occasion. I mean, the the dominating f- truism here is that people are very suspicious of something that's free. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, and and the governments of a great many countries uh, do give away very large numbers of condoms. Particularly, they, uh, uh, other contraceptives less so because they require a certain amount of of uh, medical supervision or at least pharmacy pharmacy supervision. Mm-hmm. And they very seldom interfere with the commercial markets or the the social marketing markets. Uh, Condoms that are given away undoubtedly do some good, and some right. people will certainly accept something that is free. But the image of the product is is never very good. <laughs> uh, I mean, we'll all take free samples, but a continuous supply of something free, I think most of us would be very suspicious of. Right. Uh, either somebody wants me to do something I don't want to do, or the quality <laughs> of the product is lousy. So we've had, uh, Brazil is a very notable case, uh, very aggressive giveaway programs by, by the government, and they make a difference, but they very seldom impact the, the commercial markets and the social marketing markets because mm. people trust something that has a well-known brand and is advertised and that they pay for. Right, right. Well, I, I want to ask... A question about marketing in this space, because I spent a year, a little bit, almost a year and a half in the space. And in the nonprofit community, I feel like marketing is a bad word. I don't know if you if you face that resistance or not, as you were starting these these initiatives and have since, you know, made them scale to the level that they are now. It just seems like marketing is always seen as something negative, and and even in the UK, I mean, uh, to, for commercial business, marketing is is kind of seen as a, an evil thing, to some degree. Well, advertising, more specifically, I think, is is uh, blamed for uh, various societal ills, but I I don't agree that marketing, particularly when you use that term. Mm-hmm. Uh, is a troublesome term in the nonprofit world, particularly today. I mean, for the I would say for the last ten years, there has been a fairly steady drumbeat of articles coming out of the Harvard Business Review and and other uh, bellwether publications uh, about uh, using marketing skills to promote uh, social benefit mm-hmm. and. So I, I don't think marketing is a dirty word in the nonprofit world at all. Uh, hospitals do a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're expected to. Uh, I'm glad. N- NPR is doing it, which annoys the hell out of me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're pulling in a, a f- considerable amount of funding by accepting sort of low uh, low profile ads that they pile on during the rush hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, especially during the call-a-thons or the... the yeah, yeah. And the pledge week, which yeah. is a disaster. Right. Uh, and that, of course, is, is a form of marketing. They right. accept ads, right. basically. So I, do, I don't think there's any okay. uh, skepticism about the usefulness and the role of marketing in, in, the, uh, in the nonprofit world. Advertising uh, does take a beating from time to time because mm-hmm. there's a segment of society that seems to be convinced that advertisers can make you want something and make you buy something that you don't want. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's true mm-hmm. uh, unless it's unless it's deliberately misleading right. or, or is otherwise misleading. The um, uh, competition... I mean, people will say, why do we need 12 different brands of toothpaste? Well, we probably don't. But if you're going to stop it at 10, how are you going to do it? Right, (laughs) right. So I I think, I mean, competition is the heart 
of the capitalist system. It's the heart of a system that that produces wealth and is the only system that we know of that produces wealth consistently right. or at all. Uh, and if you're going to have free markets, you're going to have 13 kinds of toothpaste. Yeah, I get you. Well, you know, we've been talking about DKT and its social marketing focus. Um, PSI also had some, I don't know if they still do, but have some elements of social marketing as well. Yes, no, uh, PSI has some elements of social marketing. The reason I said they, they didn't uh, pursue and haven't pursued uh, since I left them many, many years ago, uh, particularly, they, they haven't really pursued a, a model of generating revenue from the sales of their products. Mm. They are heavily dependent on donors, which is okay as long as the donors are there right. to, to help uh, subsidize your activities. And they've gotten into a lot of things other than birth control, uh, including, for example, uh, insecticide-treated bed nets, which can be very effective at preventing malaria in uh, high mosquito areas, uh, especially in Africa. But you can't sell them at a price that enables you to help run the program in any significant way. You need donors uh, for those kinds of things. Right. Uh, it's still social marketing, but mm -hmm. it's heavily donor-dependent. Got it. The DKT approach uh, realizes about 70% of program expenses, that is, the cost of, of the products themselves, the cost of the marketing and advertising, the cost of the management and, and overseeing. About 70% of all those costs are covered by a revenue from consumers, hmm. from customers so that only 30% of DKT's budget needs to be uh, supplied by donors. Okay. This is a, a, a very different, it, it leads to very different decision making. Okay. Uh, it leads to a much higher degree of flexibility and a degree of independence from, from donor uh, biases and demands, some of which are perfectly reasonable, but uh, which can add up, right? Right. Whereas PSI has always been, as is MSI, yeah. uh, fairly donor dependent for I would say eighty to ninety percent. So instead of getting seventy wow. percent coverage, yeah. they get uh, fifteen or twenty percent coverage, and the difference is quite substantial. Right. It, and to your point, I mean, it's going to take a lot more donor funding to make that go. Yes. Um, and if for whatever reason. You know, donors switch gears and move somewhere else. All of that's lost. You know, potentially the network that they've built and et cetera. It's a constant fear right. in the nonprofit world. Of course, is losing key donors. Right. Well, there's a couple more topics we want. I want to get to, but I, before we leave DKT, I always felt like it was a a unique model in how you ran the organization, and it may get to just your views on business in general. I'm not sure. Um, but I wanted to ask you about it. You you talked about specific, specifically early on these two organizations and the focus that you wanted on each of them, and that's why they were separate and what they did was separate. It seems that way in the DKT franchise, and I, I use franchise specifically here because it almost feels like each country is a franchise unto itself um, and, and fairly independent, at least from what I saw um, the short brief time I, I was in contact with folks. Um, so I, I would love to just know your philosophy on like, was that always the case from the get go? Do I have it right? First of all. And then is there a, a model of management that you're subscribing to there? Yes, you have it right. Uh, you have it quite right. The, uh, uh on a personal note, mm -hmm. I think that the tendency to delegate very large portions of, of any program, project, or, uh, or company ha arises basically from my own sense of laziness. <laughs> uh, I have always tried to find somebody else to do the hard work. And my role, to the extent that this is possible, has been to create an environment, a, a, a place where other people 
can fly, can do their own thing, can can get things done, and and uh, take possession, take ownership mm-hmm. of, of various projects. I've always felt that way about uh, PHE, for example, and um, so does David Groves, who's the president and who has the same philosophy. Uh, I'm not sure his arose out of laziness, but mine <laughs> certainly did, because if you can find other people to do the hard work, life is a lot better. Uh, and it isn't just for selfish reasons. Uh, when you delegate authority as well as responsibility uh, to people, they have a lot more fun because mm-hmm. they're doing their own thing. And DKT was designed along those lines so that each office is run by a person, a man or a woman, whether they're local or expat, uh, who has the opportunity to design the program the way they think it is most appropriate for the country where they're working, uh, to pick their own brands, although most uh, programs keep the brands that have been succeeding, Mm -hmm. and to to generally function autonomously and an organization that operates that way attracts people who like to do that. Mm-hmm. So, yes, the management style of DKT is, is federal, if you, if you want to call it that. It is each or each um, country mm-hmm. office has a great deal of autonomy. The, the group of projects and programs... I think is very happy to be part of something bigger, and we all get together once every year or so and uh, exchange enthusiasms and ideas. Uh, but it's a, it's an approach that I think works very well. Now it carries somewhat higher risks than running an organization that is more tightly controlled. Mm. It's easier to th- steal stuff. <laughs> and you, every once in a while you get a bad apple. Now, you, you get a bad apple in any structure, in right. any management arrangement. <clears throat> if somebody is going to be a thief, they're likely to be a thief no matter how uh, the organization is structured. But with this level of autonomy at the local level, it can sometimes take longer to ferret it out. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we've had a few, a few bad ones, but so is PSI and so is MSI. <laughs> it just Any happens. enterprise right. is going to attract a few crooks. Right. It definitely happens in any organization, for sure. One more question before we shift topics, and I want to I want to talk about your. The, the fights you've had in, in your time and legal cases and battles along the way because we've got, glossed over all the heartache, I think, at this point um, and just talked about the successes and the highlights. But before we move to that, you've been in business for 50, you know, over 50 years. Um, what do you feel like the state of business is today? I'm just curious. It's as important as ever. Mm. Nothing else can happen if if you don't have a viable business community in in any country, in any county, in any city. Interesting book recently out by James Fallows and his wife uh, called Our Towns. They visited a lot of uh, American towns that uh, reputedly were having trouble recovering from the from the recession and the loss of. Rust Belt type jobs, uh, and and they found over and over and over again that there were communities that were coming alive, that were advancing, construction was underway, but in each of the communities that was succeeding in uh, improving and getting back uh, to a viable and 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 worthwhile a town there were business interests that provided jobs. Mm. I mean, without jobs, there's not much you can do. Right, right. So, I mean, business is, is, is crucial. 
the the whole uh, emergence of the human population from abject poverty for 150,000 years into relative prosperity over the space of two, 200 years or 250 years <laughs> has required business, has right. required uh, people exchanging goods for other goods. Um, people trade. You leave people alone, they will trade with each other. And when they trade with each other, uh, amazing things can happen. And the poor countries in the world aren't people aren't left alone. There are heavy taxes. Their mm. uh, Im imports are forbidden or or taxed so heavily that uh, businesses can't get started. Or you have something like Venezuela, where the the government just kills kills everything in the name of the greater good, so that you have people starving. The world must have free markets. Hmm. capitalism, if you will, and to the extent that it does, you have, the, you have or will attain the prosperity that enables you to do all the other things like improve health and education hmm. uh, and infrastructure uh, and, and all the rest of it, but without business, you're nowhere. Well, I want to switch gears. I think Let's talk a little bit about your fighting spirit. I think this is a quote from Tim Black. Um, says that about you, that you've always, uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because it's a long quote, but you've always just never shied away from controversy, never been awed by establishment organizations and figures in our profession or any other and that you're always in and you love a good fight. And you've had a lot of fights, uh, legal fights, legal battles over the years. Um, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind, you know, telling us of, about a few of them and maybe starting off by like, how many times have you made a case all the way to the Supreme Court? Whether you, you may not have made it yourself personally, mm -hmm. but how many cases have, have made it all the way to the Supreme Court? Uh, well, Two, uh, let's, let's divide the, the, the legal issues into two kinds. Yes. One is the, the seven-year battle that we had with the federal government who were trying to put us all in jail for disseminating obscenity. That was a defensive battle, although we went on the offense in order to win it. But right. that's, that's a, a category by itself mm -hmm. and a very a formative uh, period, certainly in my life. The two battles that, that I cheerfully took on uh, formally, offensive battles, one was a, a New York law, uh, the state of New York, which um, uh, made it illegal for any contraceptive to be sold without a prescription uh, except condoms, and condoms could only be sold in pharmacies and could not be sold to anyone under the age of 16. Uh, we simply arranged to sue the state of New York uh, on constitutional grounds, saying that these restrictions, and also you couldn't advertise, so we had a First Amendment angle there. Mm. No, uh, the, the law said you may not advertise contraceptives in any way, shape, or form. That, I'm sure, was an important component. And I'm not usually, by the time somebody, a case like this gets to the Supreme Court, there's been a disagreement among two or more circuits, circuit courts, right. courts of appeal. But I don't remember that part of the process. Uh, hmm. We sued, and it's almost as though the next thing you know, it was in the Supreme Court. Hmm. And I think it was a 7-2 decision. They said, yeah, the, the state of New York cannot forbid the advertising of contraceptives categorically across the board like that, they cannot prevent the sale of condoms to 15-year-olds uh, who may need them more than anybody else. And it was a, it was a fairly clean and neat <laughs> uh, uh, victory and uh, uh, the, the beginning of, I would say, the liberalization of uh, availability of con uh, contraceptives in, uh, in New York. The other one we took on 
taking taking the offense was a regulation by uh, USAID, the foreign assistance arm of the U.S. government, mm -hmm. which is a condition of providing funding uh, to uh, organizations that were engaged in AIDS prevention, and there were very big budgets for aid, AIDS prevention around the world in those days, had to adopt a policy opposing prostitution. This is one of those political anomalies. God knows where it came from, but there it was. Uh, and and the nonprofits who are particularly nonprofits who are working on AIDS prevention say we have to work with prostitutes all the time. How can we have a policy opposing prostitution when those are some of the most important customers for HIV and AIDS prevention? Right. And we sued, and that one did go. Uh, we won at the at the, the district court level, and I've forgotten what state it was. That was appealed, and we lost at the at the cir at the uh, uh, D.C. Circuit level, mm -hmm. uh, and then that was appealed to the Supreme Court, and they agreed. With, I mean, this is what they call coerced speech. Hmm. You can't tell somebody what they have to say. That opinion was was written by Chief Justice Roberts, so we were particularly pleased. Uh, basically, a free speech case, and uh, an important one, and and uh, one we are are very proud of. Right. Well, you you um, you also have the DKT Liberty Project um, as well. We didn't we haven't talked about that yet. Um, but I know uh, you do take on specific legal battles and 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 policy issues as it relates to what you're, the work that you're doing there, um, whether it's free speech, um, just the notion of personal liberty. And I'm curious if these early fights shaped your views, or did you already ha have kind of a? And I hate to put labels on people, but did did you have more of a libertarian view? early in life. Oh, yeah. I've been a libertarian for as long as I, I can remember. My, my libertarian view solidified to the point where I, if anybody asked me what I am in the political terms, I simply say I'm a libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Milton Friedman's TV series called Free to Choose, mm -hmm. and it's a brilliant series on... Uh, uh, basic uh, free market standards and and leaves you with a, a very strong libertarian uh, sense. I, I was ready for that when I saw the series and it, it completely, and this, this would be 20, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, it, it solidified my sense of, of uh, libertarianism basically. Uh, that when the government gets patronizing and tries to tell us what to do, uh, the government should be stopped. Right. Um, except in special cases. Hmm. So that that has been part of my psychological and mental makeup, if you if you like, for several decades at, right. at the very least. Right. Where does this this fighting spirit come from? Do you know where that comes from? Well, part of it, a part of it is um, my feeling uh, about government. Hmm. Uh, I get no pleasure from suing, you know, I, it, I would never sue our neighbor because he left a two-by-four inside <laughs> his front door and I fell down and broke my leg. I mean, I don't believe in that at all. Right. Uh, the only pleasure I take is from uh, slowing down the government, keeping the government from dominating our lives. So uh, the fighting spirit, to some extent, uh, is, is tied to my, my views about liberty and freedom and leaving people alone and uh, therefore, the enemy uh, is always, and so far at least, well, I was going to say so far, the federal government, we took on the state of New York in that one case, so mm -hmm. state government as well, 
And that, of course, was solidified by the seven years that we spent fighting the, the federal governments, right. the Department of Justice, who were trying to shut us down on the basis of the sexual, se- sexual orientation of what we were selling, uh, the videos at that time. The <coughs> videos are no longer a major part of P- PHE's <laughs> business. We sell mostly toys, vibrators and lubricants and accoutrements uh, for a better sex life. But in those days, we were selling a lot of DVDs. And even going back further, um, uh, VCR cassettes, if Mm -hmm. you have ever heard of those. (laughs) (laughs) I have. I have, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And uh, the the government had, and the Justice Department had a little cell, a little unit to go after sex in those days and they came after us they came after a lot of other people they shut down some some other companies and uh they they uh, raided your office they raided us they came in they shut the place down they lined up our employees interrogated them all searched them all although i I, they didn't commit any violence or anything right uh they're perfectly civilized about it it just they they became the enemy because they were trying to put us out of business and tell us what we could sell and what we couldn't, and we simply fought back, right. and and uh, in the process uh, of um, stopping them, slowing them down, we had lawyers negotiating with them uh, over many many months and indeed many years. Uh, we had a trial. Uh, the company and I were put on trial in Alamance County, a, you know, full-fledged uh, obscenity trial. Hmm. And uh, that was fairly early in this, in this process. Uh, and uh, uh, the Alamance County jury, uh, most of whom defined themselves as born-again Christians, were subjected to I think nine hours of hardcore sexual uh, <laughs> tapes, and uh, we were we were pretty worried because it's a conservative community. Right. Yeah, but our lawyers did a fantastic job um, on the subject of the free speech and whether the government could tell us what to watch or not, what to see. Hmm. And they acquitted us. They said no. We uh, and, and basically they said. Uh, this company and this man are not guilty of disseminating obscenity because we find that this material is not obscene, which the jury has absolute authority to do. But the feds, this was a state a state case, an Alamance County case. Mm-hmm. The feds didn't give up um, and kept working on us, indicting us. We were indicted in Utah. We were almost indicted in Alabama. They worked us over pretty good, but um, we, we were able to stand up and fight them, and it did give me uh, a considerable respect for the system of justice in this country hmm. if you have enough money to fight it. Right. That whole process over many years cost us over $2 million, and if we hadn't been able to come up with that $2 million, I'm not sure what would have happened. Uh, But eventually we sued them uh, over some constitutional principles having having to do with multiple simultaneous indictments, which at some point they realized they were going to lose on or at least lose some big parts of. So they negotiated a settlement. and have left us alone ever since. But uh, that experience certainly gave me a taste of what the federal (laughs) government can do to you uh, when they have a mind to. Right, right. Well, I I don't know how you maintained through that period, frankly. Uh, Well, people have said, you know... it was very brave of you to stand up to the federal machine. You right. were very courageous. I said, Hell, we had no choice. You had no options. Yeah. yeah if, we, if we were going to survive as a business, we had to fight. Right. I didn't consider it particularly brave. It was survival. Mm. That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. 
Well, I, I also discovered, by the way, yeah. that people in general are not afraid of what you think they're going to be afraid of. After that raid and everybody had been searched and everybody had been sent home and they closed us all down, right. I thought nobody would show up the next day. I right. thought everyone would quit. Yeah. They were back and they were mad. <laughs> we probably lost a half dozen employees out of that whole thing, but everybody else said, show me where to go to work. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, they've right. got no right to do this to us. Right. They've got no right to shut us down. They've got no right to tell us what's obscene and what isn't. And that was very uplifting. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, not to put a theme on it, but you're messing with their livelihood. You're messing with their ability to support their family. They're going to fight, you know, for most people. Yeah. Most people. Most people aren't scared. Well, thank you for this. Uh, there's a, a couple, a few more questions that I tend to ask everybody, but um, I have one more for you specifically, and then we'll kind of get into these last remaining questions. But you've achieved so much, um, and you're still going. It, it looks like you still work pretty often, even though you say you're lazy. Um, I, I think listeners are probably going to not believe that, that you're lazy. Well, I'm lazy in the <laughs> sense that everything I do... Now, particularly right. that I'm 81 and I can afford it, mm -hmm. I hire somebody else to do. <laughs> well, that's great. That's a great place to be. Yes, it is a great place to be. <laughs> Are you thinking about retirement? Are you still going? Well, I, I am retired in the sense of uh, no longer being involved in the decision-making uh, in any of the organizations that I founded. Uh and that makes a huge difference because uh, there, there's no pressure on me day to day to decide this, decide that. Right. Somebody needs to be fired, which right. is one of the most unpleasant and horrible jobs that any manager can face. Uh, somebody else going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the creative decisions as well. So I'm, I'm more or less retired. I am finishing up a book with a co-author. Mm. Uh, who's done most of the work in, in <laughs> appropriate fashion. And we do have the DKT Liberty Project, but I have a guy there, uh, a very capable guy named A.C. Bushnell, who's a fiddler, among other things. Hmm. And he does most of the work with criminal justice reform, uh, civil asset forfeiture, wow. and these are... Are small projects, but they keep nibbling away. I think at the issue of freedom and liberty, mm -hmm. uh, and keeping the government from sitting on us, right, right, till, till we get squeezed to death, right. Well, let me move on. Um, and we've been talking about you a lot, and and I apologize if if the answer to this question is something we've already mentioned or already talked about, but. I always like to ask people to come on the, the podcast. Um, is there an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Well, I've already, I've already given you one of them yeah. from, uh, from India. The seven-year battle uh, with the feds uh, certainly was another. Mm -hmm. Going back even further... I think that uh, some of the attributes that that um, that we've been talking about mm -hmm. that have described why I approach uh, things in a, in a certain way. Uh, I I think my upbringing had something to do with this as well. Yeah. Among other things, when I th when I think about this, uh, nudity in my family was never an issue. We used to go out with, with other groups of people and uh, go skinny dipping in lakes in northern Michigan. Nobody <laughs> thought anything about it. So I, uh, I've never thought that nudity was sinful in any way. It just seemed perfectly natural. Natural, yeah. Hmm. And I'm grateful for that. Right, right. And it, it probably is one of the reasons I'm more comfortable with, with sexual sexually oriented merchandise than a lot of other people. Uh, 
there's another aspect of my personality that my father certainly ingrained in me. And we weren't terribly close, my father and I, but, but we had a, a working relationship. <laughs> and uh, he was adamant that you never borrow money. Hmm. Um, he and my mother uh, saved up when they early in their marriage, they saved up for six months before they could buy a refrigerator. And he said, we will not get it until we have the money to pay for it. <laughs> I once asked him, I said, what do you think about buying stock on margin? And he looked at me and said, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. It's a form of borrowing. Mm-hmm. Um, incidentally, um, um, in his most... Uh, recent speech to the stockholders in in Omaha, Warren Buffett said pretty much the same thing. Uh, If if you get into debt with your credit cards, you're always going to be a little behind all your life. And if you stay out of debt, you're always going to be a little ahead. And (laughs) it'll make a huge difference over a period of many decades. Um, Same same principle. So I've I've always felt very strongly about that. Hmm. Um, And I have to give my parents credit. I mean, my my sisters have a great many things to say about our parents that they find disappointing. That is, they have been disappointed Hmm. uh, in some uh, aspect of their, their upbringing. Uh, but the boys had it easier, and I recognize that. And being one of the boys, and probably favored for that reason. Uh, but there's a high level of trust, I think, and a and a high level of integrity. I mean, you you did what you said you were going to do. You you stuck by your word. If you committed yourself to something, you were going to do it. And uh, um, that is very, very important. I think that in any career, integrity comes first. And if you've got integrity, you can start putting the other things on. Education and even enthusiasm can be added. But if you don't have integrity, uh, you're simply not going to get anywhere, in my view. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I picked that up pretty early. Yeah. Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Well, what what keeps you going these days? What fuels you? Well, I'm slowing down. I'm not... Uh, <laughs> you look pretty spry to me. Well, uh, the parts wear out. <laughs> the knees and the ankles and the shoulders. Uh, no, I don't uh, I don't do nearly as much work as I used to and, and don't feel I should or need to. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, because PHE is a successful company, mm-hmm. and I do own a chunk of it, uh, I can afford to promote some ideas and uh, and and support some efforts toward freedom. Mm-hmm. And it would be very foolish not to do that. So I, I'll continue doing those things uh, where I can, but probably at a pretty leisurely pace. Okay. Well, this podcast is about largely about marketing. Uh, we get into many, many other topics. So I have two marketing questions for you, and I, I hope they hit on a uh, hit you, and they're not odd questions. <laughs> well, odd is a, fine. Uh, um, are there any brands or companies that you follow? Things that you just love, um, or you think are doing great things that you think others should know about? Well, one uh, group, one organization Mm -hmm. that is is very, very little known called the Atlas Network uh, is doing uh, a very good job, and I think they're the only organization devoted primarily to this, uh, promoting uh, uh, free market principles in developing countries, although they do some work in the United States as well, Mm -hmm. Uh, working with think tanks and... Uh, other local groups to bring about changes in laws and regulations that make it easier to do business. Hmm. Uh, one of the 
simplest examples of, of one of the things that <coughs> they did uh, in India uh, through a, a very dynamic uh, group that calls itself a think tank, but they, they're a lobbying group, and I don't think they'd be embarrassed to be called that <laughs> because they're local and it's, not perfectly, it's perfectly legal to lobby in India just as it is here. Um, there was a rule that said rickshaws, bicycle rickshaws, um, can only be owned by the rickshaw walla, that is, by the guy who's actually uh, peddling the rickshaw. Hmm. Uh, and the result was that the number of rickshaws was very limited. Um, um, and it, you know, it was fairly clear that uh, among the urban transport uh, uh, options in New Delhi, uh, that this this was a significant shortage. Well, they got this law changed, and almost overnight, the number of rickshaws started to multiply because. Uh, an entrepreneur could own ten or twenty or fifteen or whatever, right. and would hire people to 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 ride them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you had a free market instead of a uh, instead of one that was tied up in knots and res and and restricted. Um, anyway, Atlas mm -hmm. works with local organizations that do those kinds of things, and I don't think there's any other organization in the country or in the world that does. Hmm. Um, that is important and very, very little recognized. That is trying to get the rules, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, changed so that businesses can be started, that businesses can succeed, hmm. Uh, that people can trade and import and take part in the in the world economy, because that's the only way out of poverty, and it's an almost surefire way out of poverty, right. as we've seen in China, for example. Mm. Um, when Deng Xiaoping uh, liberalized the economy and allowed China to become, at least in economic terms, capitalist. Um, so I, I admire Atlas enormously for that. Hmm. There's another organization that's active here in the United States in, in protecting the rights of Americans um, called the Institute for Justice, uh, and they, they litigate on free speech issues, on the freedom to work issues. They've done some some very nice cases with African uh, women who live and work in the United States and make a living braiding hair. Mm -hmm. And several of the states require cosmetology licenses for braiding hair if you're going to charge people for it. The the requirements for the cosmetology license are usually fifteen hundred dollars in six months, learning stuff that has nothing whatsoever to do with braiding hair and doesn't even include braiding hair. <laughs> and uh, IJ has taken several of those cases to court and won, hmm. just to give people the right to make an honest living doing something they know how to do and that you don't need a license for. Right. Um, so that's another uh, outfit that that I think, which I support, yeah. uh, as well as Atlas, that I think deserves uh, a lot of credit. Now, you weren't just talking about organizations. I'm not sure yeah. what, what else you were referring to. Well, organizations, or um, you know, as simple as products that you like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I it it sounds like you're a man of modest. Me modest uh pursuits <laughs> so you probably don't have any flashy things but yeah um no i've never i've never uh had any zeal for things. wasting money on <laughs> luxuries um um or certainly visible luxuries <laughs> um 
but I no, I don't. There, there's no product that comes to mind yeah. uh, that that comes to mind that is underrated. Uh, the main thing in the world of products is to have open competition and free markets, so everybody can choose for themselves. There you go. I like it. Last question for you. Um, you're you've been a Innovator, I think, is an appropriate term as it relates to social marketing. Um, what do you see for the future role of marketing? Where do you think it could go? I, th- I think marketing will be forever what it has been for the last 200 or 250 years. That is a way to reach customers and potential customers with a message uh, to persuade them uh, to buy your product or your service, and persuade is the key. The key word there. The difference between freedom uh, and lack of freedom is whether you can be coerced mm. into something. You can't be coerced into joining the Catholic Church, but you certainly can do it voluntarily. You can't be coerced into buying a Gillette razor. They've got to convince you that it's a good deal. Mm-hmm. The only party in a, in a legitimate modern society that can coerce you into doing things is the government. That's <laughs> why they must constantly be held to task. Well, Phil, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, my pleasure. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Do you struggle to get your website or app to deliver the awesome customer experience you were looking for? That's where Light Matter comes in. Bloomberg and McCann already trust them. Visit lightmatter.com. That's L I G H T M A T T E R.com. And tell them Alan sent you.